Are corporations keeping you from home ownership? At the moment, there's a lot of people believing that corporations are buying up all of the single family homes, in turn, keeping supply low, making house prices higher, and more importantly, keeping you from home ownership. So Josh, let's dive into this topic. We have a lot of comments, a lot of people always reaching out saying corporations are the problem. We've got to ban them. Are they really a problem? More importantly, what can we do to you know, get around it if there is a solution? And more importantly, how can we help our listeners become educated home buyers? Well, as a podcast, it's a little bit difficult to throw a lot of numbers at you. We have the numbers. Jeb and I have been up to our eyeballs in these numbers over the last week or so going back and forth. Hey, did you see this? What am I missing here? What do you see there? But really, the genesis of the conversation here is that we get com comments, whether it's a question on the live show, whether it's a comment on one of these videos that uh, first time buyers can't catch a break. You can't buy because you're having to, to fight against these corporate buyers. They are out there, but vastly overblown, much like we talk about everything in the media. If it bleeds, it leads. So you can put out these headlines. Um, we have politicians, politicians. We love politicians on the show out there trying to uh, get headlines by proposing legislation that's not going to go anywhere that doesn't solve an issue that is not nearly as big of an issue as what you may have been led to believe so today we hopefully want to give you some context with this of what it looks like and give you a mindset and an approach to what you can control and how you can proceed in the market no and that's good i mean i guess what are we really talking about we're talking about the idea that supply at the moment is anemic it's been very, very low since the pandemic. And there's a belief that the reason inventory is so low is because these corporations are essentially buying up all of the properties. And in turn, not only are they pushing up rents in these markets, they're inflating home prices, and more importantly, making it very difficult to compete as a single family um, or as a buyer trying to purchase a single family home. So Josh, let's actually dive into some of the numbers here because it's important to understand when we talk investor, what we're talking about, because the, the term investor gets overblown. It gets overused in many different ways, right? When I think of investor, I think of the small guy, the, the mom and pop guy, the, the guy that owns three to four properties. Maybe he owns one in, in addition to, or they own one in addition to their single family home versus the person that owns a hundred or even a thousand, because that's really what these people want to believe is, is the problem. And, and, and don't get me wrong. It is a problem in some markets. And that's really what we're going to talk about. So let's look at CoreLogic's definitions because it's, it's helpful. Someone has to set these arbitrary definitions and they follow, fall in line pretty much with what you were uh, what you were thinking there. And when we look at that, their definition of a small investor is three to 10 units. By that, by that measurement, I'm a small investor. Uh, I have clients that bought their first home, moved to their second home, were able to keep it. They're that classic definition of what you think. They have one rental. They're able to use leverage. They're able to get inflation on their side versus fighting against them at the grocery store every day. Um, so small investors, medium investors now 11 to 100 properties. These are real serious investors. We, I've met people like this at investment club meetings and uh, an individual that owns 25, 30 homes, they've dedicated a life to doing that. You don't yeah, acquire absolutely. these in five minutes. You have, you have put that in. And a lot of those people, it is their full-time job. Um, many of these folks, when they retired, added and, and went full-time at that after quitting a job at 55 or 60, but serious. But again, when you're talking 11 to 100 units out of 82 million in the U.S., not a significant portion. So now we're going to get to the groups that are. Large investors are defined as 101 to 1,000 units. That's not really an individual any longer. That's going to be some type of entity with many employees managing a full-time operation. And really, the stuff that gets hit in the headlines, Jeb, that we're talking about, that people freak out about is mega investors. 1,000, uh, more than 1,000 units owned. And important to know here, only 32 such entities operating in the U.S. right now. 32 corporate entities that own a more than 1,000 units. And they collectively own 445,000 units. So that's you a, had the number. Seems like a, what? that's a big number. It's a big number. Right. It's a big number, but let's yeah. put it into context. We just said 82 million single family units in the U.S. So whether that's condos, single family homes, 82 million single unit, single family units, 440,000 is like 0.006%. It's less than 1%. 
of that 0.06 percent it's less than one percent of it and when we talk jeb if you throw all of these groups together and short-term investors the number is 574,000 units held by all of them combined and when you look at what did you say the number jeb is 18 million for rent single no, family units million. just over US. 15 million single family homes just are for rent million. dedicated for so, rent properties all of those people combined, including the short-term holders, 574,000 units, that's three and a half percent of that market. So if you're an investor, they are three and a half percent of your competition. Mm -hmm. But for you as a first-time buyer going out to enter the market, in most of the United States, these folks are not your competition. Now we can look at certain markets, um, a couple that, that jump to mind immediately, Atlanta, Phoenix, mm -hmm. during the pandemic, institutional investors went big and we say why did they go big because money was really cheap and rents were spiking and homes had not seen all of this appreciation so when you look at yields as an investor what do you want i have funds i want to invest and i want to get a yield housing is attractive because they're borrowing they're not paying cash for all of this they have a little bit of cash they can borrow at really low rates an appreciating asset that makes them money and accelerating rents that will give them a yield on the cash that they invested those numbers were really attractive for about two years. And once rates started going up, we have, are in the same position for these folks. What we're going to look at, the reason why this is fresh in everyone's mind in 21 and 22, early 22, late 20, mm -hmm. early 21, or 21 and early 22, these guys were buying a lot of properties. They have been net neutral for the last two years. Are they still buying properties? Yes, but at a pretty low number and they're selling as many as they're keeping. So some of them have, have added a little bit to their holdings, some of them have dipped a little bit, but most of them are in a holding pattern using the current market to rotate up to the core holdings, the properties that they really like. No, and, and, and so who are we talking about here? Well, that's exactly what we're gonna dive into in just a moment, right after you hit that thumbs up if you find any value in this content at all. And if you wanna stay updated on topics like this, everything mortgage and real estate related, do us a favor and subscribe to the channel. So Josh, when we're talking, corporate investors, a lot of times the, the names that come to mind are Blackstone, BlackRock, um, Invitation Homes, which is a part of BlackRock. Um, you have some iBuyers out there. For, for the longest time, you had you know, Open Door, which is still around, probably one of the few iBuyers that, that's actually still out there. Uh, but you had Zillow. You had different uh, you know, companies, if you will, formed to essentially try to buy homes at a discount. Now, the iBuyer model is a little bit different. Now, they get a bad rap because they come in and they buy these single family homes, but their, their, their motive isn't to hold on to these properties. Their motive is to get a house at a discount, right? Because a seller needs to liquidate fast for cash for whatever reason. They buy it typically under market value, and then they may or may not do some improvements to it, and then they turn around and sell the property. So that property, is it a, is it a problem? In some markets, it was absolutely a problem because Phoenix was one of those markets where you had a huge iBuyer population coming in buying these properties. Some of them were kept for rentals, but the majority of, of the markets out there, and we often talk about real estate being local, this is really one of those times, guys, when we say real estate is local, some markets were really affected. Whereas markets like us, Josh, Southern California, higher price points, rents don't cover you know, that, that, that yield spread, if you will, whatever they're able to borrow money, it just doesn't make sense. So it, it was never a problem here, but that is what we need to talk about because it's, it's, again, there was an article Josh recently that said something like, uh, institutional investors are buying 40% of the homes in the market. And you're like, what are you talking about? 40%? There's no world in which they're buying 40%. They don't even own remotely close to 40%. We beat up on journalists all the time. The reality is journalism does not pay well. You don't have these long-term career journalists like we had when, you know, 20, 25 years ago. So for the most part, these are young folks. Uh, a lot of times their pay is measured on clicks, how many clicks their ads get or their, their articles get because they are online and they are looking for something that will generate a click. Oftentimes that leads to bad analysis. They're not statisticians. And when you look at that number, you saw the headline, it was 44%. Investors are buying 44% of, of single family homes. And it was a just a horrific abuse of, of ca the calculation. Uh, you could back your way into seeing how they got it, but it was a, a million times off. So 
what is the issue here? If you are wanting to get into the market and you are perceiving this as a problem for you, there's two issues. So you mentioned that the iBuyers aren't an issue because they don't really impact supply. They take supply off in the short run, but they bring it back on, whether that's three months, six months, nine months down the line, no net difference to the supply of available homes. But a lot of times what they did, they were able to go in with their lump sum of cash and get a discounted property that maybe needed a little bit of work, clean it up, make it present nicer, not full blown renovations for the most part, but sometimes they did and bring them back onto the market at the top of the market at an accelerating market. So they did lead uh, the way in terms of helping home prices move higher, but it, it didn't so much limit supply. And that's not an issue right now because they don't operate. So who is being impacted by institutional buyers, these mega buyers of, of homes. Mm-hmm. It's really, again, only people at the entry level in markets that have a good economy and affordable housing. So again, the two that we mentioned there, Phoenix and Atlanta, have relatively affordable housing, even though it's gone up 40, 50% over the last four or five years. So from an institutional perspective, you go, hey, there's a good economy, we can own these. We have plenty of people that will rent them because it's a good, strong economy and the yield still kind of makes sense. But going back to that, Jeb, that is why they're not net buyers right now because anything that they're adding in and financing now at this point in time, it's at a higher price and it's at a much higher interest rate. So they're looking at the same thing you are as a buyer, you're going, hey, if I'm owning this and I need it to break even at least as a rental so that it can make me money over the long haul, that's harder to do with higher prices and and higher interest rates. So really today, if you are out fighting and competing, it is very unlikely that you are going to come across an institutional buyer looking at the same inventory that you are wanting to make an offer on. No, and Josh, we we've we looked at the map, right, of where these guys were buying homes. And if you look at the map, it's really concentrated from like say the Phoenix market, Arizona, down across, you know, the bottom third of the United States. You know, carries you across Texas, Louisiana, you know, Alabama, into Florida, Georgia, kind of up. And then you get to probably South Carolina, right? And that's where it stops for the most part. Now, are there markets up there in Ohio and some of these markets that that see this? Absolutely. But it's really concentrated on where are people migrating to? Like you said, good economies, where what what, what demand for rents are are higher than than some markets and where can we buy homes under the median home price? And that's exactly who is being affected. It's those that are looking to buy under the the median home price, the national median home price which give or take $400,000 for for most markets out there. So if you're in that price point in one of these markets, there's probably a little bit more competition. But Josh, that's typically speaking not what is really driving home prices. We've talked about, you know, over the last 2 years, we saw a, a shift in a couple of different things, work from home and and politics, people wanting to get out of states and and just a lot of things that cause people to migrate to different areas along with super low rates, right? Those low rates, which people have a very hard time understanding how much demand, I even have a hard time understanding how much demand was actually pulled forward because of low rates. People that wouldn't have bought in 21, they were probably buyers in 22, maybe even 23, just based on where they were in that that life cycle, if you will, demographics, which we've talked about many times. They were pulled forward because it's like, whoa, I can now buy a house cheaper than I can go rent a property because rates are here. Why wouldn't I do that? So now you took all of those buyers that were essentially going to be buyers at some point, just a little later in life. Now they're buying earlier, creating demand, you know, driving up prices along with institutional investing in some cases. And Josh, like I said, I've never had a buyer in a bidding situation that I was aware of where I was competing against a big company. Right. These a lot of times these big companies, when they buy properties, they're buying them in bulk. They're not buying one property at a time. And I think that's hard for for people to realize, like they're buying up communities in some cases, like, you know, Texas builds a new track. They buy the whole thing up and turn it into rentals. That's a that's a bigger problem. Right. Versus versus the guy buying one and two here and there. Well, a bigger problem. The big problem is these entire build to own communities. We talked about it a little bit on the live show the other week. Phoenix is sort of ground zero for this um, number of areas in Texas. Well, you have a a whole community that would come online and would normally be 300 entry level units 
is no longer there and it goes straight to rent, that's tough. Uh, and especially when we talk about builders have pretty healthy margins, 20 to 30% margins. So if you're able to build that inventory, you just got a 20 to 30% discount relative to the owner looking to buy it. And so your yield and your hoped for future appreciation on your smaller initial investment is really, really good as an in investor. So that is a smaller element, but something that definitely bears watching. If we look, one of the reasons why we are undersupplied is the cost of building, planning, permitting, acquiring land, the cost of, of raw materials. We've talked about over the last, you know, year, two, three years, how much building materials have gone up and the inflation rate is not what it was, but those prices have remained elevated for almost all of those goods. So when, when we look at that, that is an issue that we want to be aware of because if we already have a point where the economics for a builder is really difficult and they determine their solution is, hey, we have to build these to rent versus building to sell, that will exacerbate the undersupply issue. Again, in most markets for us in California, this is not an issue. The, the number of build to own units is, is minuscule. But in other parts of the country, it is a real thing. Um, we can talk about potential solutions. We've, we've said a million times on the show, neither of us are big fans of government intervention. But housing is, is something that is essential and important. And when we look at long-term trends, we talk a million times here on the show, 40 times greater net worth for homeowners. If we're making it harder for younger folks to become homeowners, we are making a problem 20, 30 years down the line. But again, from politicians' perspective, they don't think in 20 to 30 year cycles. They think in terms of two to four year reelection cycles. And this isn't something that gets a lot of traction. So I don't know how likely we are to have solutions in the near term. How about yourself, Jeff? Well, no, I mean, I, I think you said something that I want to go back to, but solutions are tough. Building is the solution. New homes are the solution. That's the solution. The problem is, again, all of the things that you just mentioned. And inflation has been a problem, right? Not, not only is it taking raw material good, the cost up, it's also one of the drivers of house prices going up. People don't understand how inflation actually affects housing prices. You know, Josh, we calculated risk. It's it's a, a Substack that both in you both you and I subscribe to, and he gives an example in there of was it twenty six years over the course of twenty six. No, it was shorter. It was it was just from twenty ten. Was it three hundred thousand dollar home in twenty ten through today would be four twenty seven just based off of inflation. Yeah, I mean, so you look at that and you go, well, the corporations are the problem. Maybe they're a percentage of the problem. They're not the problem. There are multiple problems here. And, you know, on the show, the reason that we do the show is we're trying to educate you and help you control the things that you can control. And often what we hear and why these comments kind of stick with us and why we address them is because it's like a negative mindset. And we've talked about, you know, negativity and, and it really has no place in, in trying to do this. Yeah, it sucks. Is it the end all? Is it you know going to be the one thing that stops you? No, there there are things that you can control that you can work on to become a better you know put yourself in a better position to become a homeowner. But with that, Josh, let's talk about real numbers right now. So people are saying, hey, first time home buyers can't even buy a house right now. Well, the latest stats from the existing home sales report show that twenty six percent twenty six twenty six percent of buyers out there in the market currently are still first time home buyers. Big percentage. Um, investors make up 21%. So, but those investors, Josh, we're not talking mega investors here. We're talking all investors, right? One, somebody that buys, owns a property, buys another one. That's considered an investment property. So that, that's actually up from 17%. So you got a little bit more investor activity happening in the market, which is a bit surprising to be completely honest, because again, prices are higher, yields, rates, yields are down, uh, rates are higher. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense to do this. Well, Jeb, I would love to, I would love to see the numbers on that, Jeb, of how many are net purchasers or people rotating into better properties. The investors that I see in the market right now are saying, yeah. I will use this opportunity to sell what I deem a lesser property to something that I would hold over the longer haul. So I would bet that 20 something percent that is investor, a lot of cash buyers selling other properties and paying cash because we do have a big chunk of well, cash. 33% are cash buyers at the moment. 33% yep. of cash. I would bet a lot of those investors are cash buyers rotating. Hey, I'm going to sell two properties 
properties, buy one for cash. So they are buying, but I think that's a little bit more of a rotation than actual net buying because we saw the numbers. Um, I don't know whether Bill did it in calculated risk or if it was on Resi Club. They were running the the yields, the yield numbers. There's only like 20 markets in the U.S. where anything shy of a monster down payment makes any sense as an investor on the yield perspective. So I didn't, I didn't mean to to cut no, you no, off, but, but I mean I that's did, good. I did want to say that. I, those investors, I don't think it's it's just people going, hey, you know what? I have some money and a great investment today would be a rental property. No, and we're not downplaying any of this stuff. It's just, hey, giving you the facts and just saying, hey, this is what it is. You can let it affect you or you can just roll with the punches, so to speak, and focus on what you can focus on and you know, continue to to, to move forward. And so you know, we, we said 33% of, of transactions out there are cash. Josh, I see that as a bigger problem than anything else for a lot of first-time home buyers because you know, you are, you're, you're a lot of these buyers, three, 5% down at some point, maybe it changes in the future happen. There's commissions now that have to be paid on top of that. in some, in some instances, and I just listed a property, Josh, $1.6 million, roughly four of the five offers were cash offers. So that's just shocking I mean, at $1.6 million. So just, Hey, we've got, you know, there's money out there in the market. So, you know, we like to always point out, focus on those things that you can control your credit, your down payment, you know, budgeting, putting yourself in the best position so that when an opportunity does present itself, you're there and able to take advantage of it rather than looking out for the boogeyman or the headline. It's, you know, all about context. And Jeb, I, I want to double down on what you just said because context, people love to take out of context when we say that you guys don't care. You don't care about first time buyers. All you don't care about affordability. All you care about is whoever can get a loan. And if you get enough loans or you have enough sales, it's not a matter of not caring. Just as you said, Jeb, that 26% of the market is first time buyers. We are successfully working with first time buyers on a day to day basis. Mm -hmm. And they have a fundamentally different attitude than the folks that are not able to do it. You know, if you're sitting here focusing on, I can't do it because of iBuyers, I can't do it because cash buyers, I can't do it because of invest institutional buyers. Do you control any of those things? Can you stop cash buyers? Can you stop institutional buyers? Can you stop flippers? You can't control any of that. So when we say you need to buy when the time is right in, in your life, if you've determined that now is the time for you to buy, for you to get your family into a home, you can sit here and say, hey, these are things that are bad and I'm going to let them stop me. Or you can say, these are things that are bad that I have no control of. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to control the controllables, the things that are under my control, my credit score. Can I get a raise at work? Can I get a second job? Can I get a, a you know, go back to school and get a certificate that gets me more money, whether that's welding, whatever it is. There's a million paths to this. We literally see it all day. I mean, there's a misconception by many of the people that listen to the show, because you and I are in Southern California, oftentimes these numbers sound huge to them. My average loan amount is about $600,000. That in Southern California is a low number. That is, we are dealing with first time buyers. We're helping a lot of people in Sacramento, Fresno, Bakersfield buy 200, 300, $500,000 homes. So my entire career has been first time buyers. When I started in 1996 in Anaheim, you could get a condo for $40,000. You get a three bedroom house, probably one bath for about $120,000. Those people have, have built up equity and become move up buyers. So yeah, we do million five, $2 million purchases for those people that bought 30 years ago. But my bread and butter is these people. Their pain is my pain. If they can't get in, if we can't come up with solutions, then that's less business to be had. You know, Jeb, there's that there's a misconception. Probably the biggest one out there is, oh, you guys love it when prices go higher. No, no. I want a volume of business. I don't want big transactions. So when the transactions get big and affordability gets crushed, there is less volume of transactions. So your problems are our problems. I'm saying that I don't see anything within my control or your control that's going to change anything in the next one to two to three years. So what can we control to help you become an educated home buyer and an educated home owner? No, and understand, Josh and I don't really make any money here off the podcast. We're here spending our time and, and resources when we could be doing other things to educating home buyers. Many of you first time home buyers. So that that is our goal is to provide education so that you can get, you know, the dream, accomplish the dream, accomplish the goal of becoming the homeowner. That is the most important piece. 
Now, with that, Josh, I think it's also important to understand. I just want to go back to some of the numbers I'm in. Ago. I mentioned a moment ago, 26% currently first time home buyers. That number never really goes outside of the low 30s, right? So in a hot market, you're not seeing that number double. It's not like 50% are first time home buyers. No, it doesn't happen. In any given market, investors make up somewhere between 15 to 20 ish percent of, of investors out there. So, yeah, it's 21 now. So, it's a little bit higher, but that's not really that much out of the norm. So, again, Josh said it earlier focus on the things that you can control to put yourself in the best position possible. Now, if you're looking to become a homeowner, you want somebody that can help guide you through the process, answer your questions. Josh and I would love the opportunity to do that. There's actually a referral link in the description below that'll get you in touch with Josh and I. And if we can't help you and you're in another market that we don't serve, that link will get you in touch with one of our trusted referral partners that can do the job just like we can. So Josh, we've, we've discussed it. It is a problem. It's not the problem that everybody thinks it is. What should be your parting or what's, what's the parting advice today outside of controlling the things that we've talked about? That really is the only thing that any of us can do. You can wake up each day and think of all of the bad things. I mean, the best example I have, um, a relative recently told my wife and I, I got, said, I don't think you guys understand. Like things are really bad in this country. Things are going to get bad. Now that's a common thing of old people. The, the world is going terrible. But if you get up every day and you focus on the things that are wrong, that you have no control over, it's like a death spiral. So if you're listening here, to a show called The Educated Home Buyer. You want to educate yourself. You have goals. You're thinking of buying a home. Really, the only advice that we can give is focus on the things that you control. Earn, save, invest, keep your finances in line, keep your credit good, don't get overly indebted. And whether it's today or two years from now or five years from now, you will have an opportunity to get into the market. Great advice. Buy right, buy right, buy right, borrow smart, build wealth. Until next time, guys. Adios. Amigos.